My name is Mike. If we haven't had a chance to meet yet, um, my wife Ashton and I moved from Florida to Raleigh, North Carolina when we were 24 years old with three kids in diapers and our frontal cortex in our brain wasn't fully developed at the time. So we decided to plant a church from scratch. And um, I, I didn't know what to do or how to do it. Um, so I got a job at the local Panera Bread Cafe busing tables for $7.25 an hour. I think we have picture proof because pics or it didn't happen. Um, that, that, we, that we were, um, I was busing tables $7.25 an hour at the local Panera Bread. And I remember asking my manager, things were so tight at home. I asked him to not throw the bagels that were left over for that day into the dumpster, but I asked him to leave the bagels on the side of the dumpster so that I didn't have to jump into the dumpster to get the bagels to feed my family in order to plant this church in North Carolina. And we, what I would do is I would bust the tables at Panera with my eyes open to uh, seeing if anybody was praying over their broccoli cheddar soup. I didn't know who they were praying to or what they were praying for, but I knew that they were some, had some sort of spirituality and so I'd, I'd, I'd slip them an invite card to our little Bible study at our house. And uh, I don't know if they have the photos. I don't know if anybody, they're probably taking a nap, but oh, there they are. Uh, so that, that's me, that's me <laughs> before I could grow a beard, uh, having to wear long sleeves because I had showing tattoos at Panera, bussing tables 10 years ago. And uh, then they have a picture of our first gathering in our home. This was just everyone that I could... Uh, gather. The guy on the keyboard still plays the keyboard behind me every single Sunday. Has not missed a Sunday in 10 years. Wow. He has perfect attendance wow. uh, in a decade. Has never missed a Sunday. Uh, my wife is there who prayed earlier today. She did an awesome job praying for families and restoration. And uh, 10 years later, uh, we are now one church in three locations and God has really blessed us. I think they have a picture from our main location. And I don't, uh, I don't, share all this to boast. I just share all this to let you know that if God can use a punk bus boy yeah. from Panera Bread uh, that had, didn't have two nickels to rub together, he can use you. And I truly do believe in equipping and empowering you to break the 200 barrier. It is the hardest barrier to break. Yeah. And uh, I really believe that you can break it. And so what I want to do is I just want to share with you a couple of stories. Primarily, I want to share Pastor By Byron's story uh, on how they use some of the principles that I'm going to share after this with you. But before all of that, I want to invite you to breakfast tomorrow morning. I'm paying for breakfast in the chapel at 8 a.m. tomorrow. I know that some of you aren't interested in breakfast. Maybe you'll just be interested in the content that I have to share. I'll be bringing our entire staff. So if you have a youth pastor with you, my youth pastor will be there. Uh, if you have an executive pastor with you, my executive pastor will be there. And you can just ask any questions, talk church, and uh, no shame in the game if you're interested. I think they might even have a slide for that. Yes, look, they put my face on it too. Um, it's not a graphic unless your face is on it, in case you're wondering. You can just scan that. I'll have them uh, keep that up for just a couple of minutes. That's tomorrow morning at 8 a.m., totally free. And um, I just want to help as many pastors as I can. Some of you have already benefited from our conference and the program that we host over at break200.com. Either way, um, would you welcome Byron? Didn't he do an awesome job earlier? Come on. Well, thanks, Mike. Um, it's an honor for me to be here. Uh, my only regret in planting redemption is that I didn't listen to you soon enough. <laughs> Uh, early in the process, uh, Mike, I think your church was three years old at the time, and we would jump on the phone, and he would give me a lot of the content we're going to share today. It was in its early raw form, and I was like, yeah, but that's not us. Mm -hmm. We're different. Mm -hmm. We're different. And he would give me really good advice, but I, I didn't take it. Well, here I am, seven years later, um, on stage with you, because <laughs> I have now repented of my ways. <laughs> And I have turned and accepted breaking 200 in my heart. Uh, and our God has done some wonderful things. Uh, we, me and my wife, we started Redemption Church in Beaumont, Texas, uh, just now seven years ago. And during that time, I fought, I kicked, I, I scrapped every bit of the way and crawled to 200 in attendance. But what we would do is we would hit 200 
and then we'd fall back down. Anybody go in that cycle, right? I mean, you would, we would hit it and we're like, yes, we finally got it. And then, and then we would fall back down and then we would break 200 and then we would fall back down. Um, and it was only whenever we started leaning into the systems and the processes that we're gonna discuss that we were able to, to break 200. And uh, actually I have a, a graph of our church, if you could throw that up there. Um, that big dip is our no service Sundays that we do. But you can see over the last year, since we've begun implementing a lot of the resources we're gonna share, our church has actually more than doubled in size. So you, you just track that, um, what does it say at the, at the, yeah, 201 in January of 2022 uh, to where just two weeks ago we had 530. Um, and it's not really, you say, well, numbers, right? Every number has a name, every name has a story and every story matters to God. And we want to be able to reach more people. For those of you who are not good at math, um, that's a 110% increase so in one year. So good. Uh, in addition to that, here's just some more, um, some more numbers that we saw is because here's what we, we know, what we measure gets multiplied. Yeah. And yeah. so we wanna make sure our metrics, those of you who are under 200 or new church, let me give you a little piece of advice. I know as pastors, we have a different form of math than what everybody else has. <laughs> Um, but don't lie about it. I used your, to go to the parking lot, count the cars, times it by six, because six people came in every car, you know? <laughs> don't, lie, don't lie about your numbers early in the church, because when you actually get some and you look back, they're not going to be accurate, That's and you right. can't celebrate what God's actually yeah. done. Yeah. Um, and so here's what we see right now in our church. Last year, we had 495 Connect cards that were wow. filled out. Wow. Um, and out of those 495, 144 of those have joined a serve team through our Next Steps process. That's huge. Okay, so that means that almost 30% of our first time guests have become fully engaged members of our church within the last year. So, for reference, if you've been to CMN launch, the national average is around 3 to 5% of first time guests get connected yeah. into a church. So, these systems, they work. But I got some more numbers for you just to show that what you're going to learn from Pastor Mike, it really is important. Um, out of the 500 who do attend here at Redemption, 297 on. are on serve teams. Actually, we just had 17 more, so we're over 300 people are on our serve teams. 243 are in small groups. That means, that means three-fifths and 50% of our church are not just attending on a Sunday, but they are actively participating in the life of our church. Yeah. Just last Sunday, we had 50 people make a commitment to give for the first time. Wow. So we just onboarded 50 new givers in our yes. church. So what we're talking about, it really does matter. And at this point, I'm sure that some of you are thinking what I thought before as well, that in order to see these type of results, man, what are you gonna have to do? You have to water down the word. Um, you have to edit your sermons. You have to forsake or compromise the truth or your Pentecostal heritage. Well, that's what I thought too. But as we're gonna get later on into the discipleship pathway and the systems, you're gonna see that that's actually the furthest thing. In fact, this year in our church, we have actually seen dozens of divine healings take place. Amen. In our first Wednesday prayer meetings, we have seen people be delivered of demonic oppression in the so altars. Good. We have seen miracles, people with blood disorders being healed, a woman with celiac disease of 12 years. Now she's eating pizza at our next steps process. <laughs> Um, and we've seen spirit baptisms just last week. We had two people baptized in the spirit with the initial evidence of speaking in tongues. So I'm telling you, you do not have to compromise your Pentecostal heritage to have a healthy numerical and spiritually growing church as well. Um, and here's the reason why, because what you inspect is what you expect. Yeah. This is why this matters. This is why okay. breaking 200 is, is so important. It's because what you inspect is what you begin to expect so, in your church. Inspecting your church is expecting God to show up. It's, it's not all about the numbers, but what we say is this, we wanna be good stewards of the church that God has entrusted us to lead. He's, he's called you to shepherd this church. A, a shepherd needs to know the, the, the content of its flock. Proverbs says that. Yeah. You need to know how many sheep are in your flock. And if you wanna have a, 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 a career in this as a shepherd, it's about being able to take good care of that flock. And so us as calling, 
beings of shepherds, how much more should this be important to us to be able to create healthy systems, to be able to feed the sheep that God has trusted us with and develop good strategies. So let me tell you my story. We started Redemption in 2016. I went to CMN launch and my coach, to be honest, was pretty forgettable. In fact, I don't even know his name today. Um, And it wasn't necessarily that he was a bad coach, but I was a bad participant. Wow. And that's, it was probably a little bit of both, but I actually went there thinking I already knew everything. See, the thing is I had read all the books. I had already been a part of two church plants. I've read the blogs. I followed all the big name pastors. And, you know, in 2015, church planting was all of the rage at the time. And and everybody was talking about church planting. And um, and so there was books being written about it, conferences, not like this, but uh, uh, lots of pastors were championing that. And so I followed all the trends and I thought, you know what? I don't need systems and strategies like the ones we're about to learn because I believed I was the exception. I knew what type of church that I wanted to plant. But here was the problem (laughs) is that nobody else wanted to go to the church that I wanted to plant. (laughs) So for example, someone would ask me, what type of church are you going to be? What's your style? Like, what's the vibe of your church? And I would always say, hey, we're a modern church um, and we wanted to also have very uh, deeply rooted traditions. People say, are you traditional or modern, seeker sensitive? What is your style? We try to be everything because we want to be all things to all people. But if you try to do that, you're going to reach nobody. Uh, and so we had a mix, what I would say, of Hillsong, of a Catholic church with the preaching like Mark Driscoll. Uh, so we would have liturgy saying, you know, the Apostles' Creed. We would sing hymns. But at the same time, we had the welcome home signs. And my sermons would be an hour-long expository preaching. Uh, does that sound terrible to you? You're like nodding your head yes. Uh, and apparently everybody else in Beaumont thought so too. Because they didn't come. They never came. We opened our church in a bar downtown, which by the way, um, opening in a bar sounds cool, but for young families, they have a hard time bringing their kids to have church at the same place they might've been conceived at. So um, (laughs) oftentimes we would have people who would come and I'd be like, yes, we got a guest. They're like, sorry, I just forgot my ID last night. And uh, they would come in and I was like, oh, we'll just take an invite card. so anyway, uh, we opened and our grandson, uh, the grand opening, we had 171 in attendance. Come on. And the next week, 40 came back. Um, and so we grew our church down to 40 uh, very quickly. And instead of lights and stage design, I think we might have some photos as well. Instead of lights and stage design, look, that was our, our, one of our first gatherings. Um, you can look and see all the candles on the ground. <laughs> and so we would take communion. We'd have candles everywhere. Uh, and it was almost like we we're having goth for Jesus church. Uh, it was, it was, it was, it was, uh, it was a very interesting season for us. Um, and we would sing repurposed hymns like nothing but the blood. So if you can throw over to this one, to this next one, that was our grand opening. I actually was so insecure when we started the church, I wore suit and ties, uh, because I was 30 years old or I was, uh, and I didn't think anybody wanted to listen to me. And so I actually wore suit and ties. You can see all the different, uh, look, all the candles that we had everywhere. Every Wednesday night, I would just show up because our team, when putting them back in the crates, those are real candles, not LED candles. So they would spill wax all over the ground and they would call and they're like, hey, you need to come clean up all this wax. And so I got, we eventually got rid of that as well. Um, And so this was the early stages for us. Here's my my favorite. Look, uh, if you go to the one with the gig on it, um, okay, well, I'll, yeah, there you go. Redemption Church drag show. Um, <laughs> interesting. Um, that was not us that hosted the drag show, uh, <laughs> because then, because then the AG would be calling. But um, yeah, w- that we, that's where we started at, and, and we would pay our lease and set up and tear down. That actually went locally viral, which was uh, pretty I- I- interesting. And then that place closed. And we had to move to another bar. And here's the photo from our second location. It's actually our second, our third location. That was in Dixie Dance Hall. And uh, it was a country western bar. And so in the back, there would actually be, there's photos of uh, Bud Light girls and naked women on the walls. And one of the families came in and they, were, they said, they asked their teenager, they said, what'd you like about church? And they said, all the naked women on the wall. <laughs> uh, that's when we invested in pipe and drape. Uh, and we, we pipe and drape. That's why all those redemption logos are in the back. 
Uh, but I would actually say this. People would show up and then they would leave. And I would, I would literally say this from the public. We don't have a system. We got the spirits. Mm. And if you want to be here, then you'll just show up next week. Um, that was foolish of, of me. And one day the Lord convicted me and he brought me to Romans chapter eight. Uh, and, it, and he began to teach me about the spirit of adoption. And, and here's what the Lord said to me in my quiet time. He said, Byron, I'm adopting children, but I need good homes to put them in. Why would I send my kids to your house if you don't have a system to be able to care for them? Wow. See, our father's in the adoption business. So good. And you, as a pastor of a church, you are a home in which God is looking to place his kids in. And so no, no foster agency would send a child into a, into a broken home that doesn't have a system of care. So good. And so if our father is adopting kids, so then you have to have your house ready for when the father sends his kids to your house so you can take care of them. That's very good. So I was really convicted and I leaned into CMN. I've been coaching with them for the past several years, but not because I was an expert, because I was desperate and that's where I met Mike and we reconnected. He told me I'd break in 200 and we jumped in. And I have to tell you, the growth that we've experienced didn't happen overnight or even a year later. There was no magic bullet. It was a, it was a whole series yes. of different teachings right. over different subjects that we've had to take time and implement within our staff, within our team. But mostly it was about me unlearning. It was about me um, trying to untangle the mess that I had created and really start our church over internally without a public relaunch, but doing a private relaunch inside of my heart. Wow. I spent a lot of times and nights processing, doing data, holding meetings, one-on-ones. We lost several staff members over the process. Yes, some yeah. they quit, some we had to make them quit, but, um, <laughs> but we, and we'll talk about that later too, as we have a session on, on staffing. It's hard, it's gonna take hard work, but eventually, it's like water building over a dam, it will, eventually cascade. Right. And in 2022, that's when we started seeing the breakthrough. And here's what I learned. And, um, and I, I probably would not be the, the, redemption wouldn't be the church that I would go to if I wasn't the pastor. Wow. Now, I know that sounds crazy because most of the time people say, hey, if you wouldn't go to your church, you know, or then why would you expect anybody else? But to be honest, based upon my style, okay, our church just really isn't the way that I would go to church at. I would pick a different thing, but here's what I had to learn is whenever I planted the church, I had to be obedient to what God has called me to be, right? I wanna be able to help as many people as possible experience life change through Jesus. And so here's what I had to realize, that in order for him to increase, I must decrease. Wow. That it's not about me, it's about the mission. It's not about what I want, it's about what he wants. And so I am pastoring his church, and so if my opinions get in the way of him moving, then I need to get out of the way. And so what I've had to come to learn is that it's not about the church that I want, it's about the church that God wants and who he has called me to lead at. And so I signed up for Breaking 200 because, man, I had to learn how to put the mission above myself. I had to learn that, that I'm not the senior pastor of my church, Jesus is, and it's my job to be faithful uh, and it's my job to be a servant. At the end of the day, what matters is not the style, it's not the band, it's not the LED wall, it's not the website, the Instagram, it's not the vibe check, it's not any of those things. What matters most is are people getting saved and are the saved being discipled and are the disciples being sent out? So That's good. what matters most. And in order for you to do that, so you need good. to have a system and a strategy in place to make that happen. And so here we are two years later, we're implementing these systems that you're about to learn. Right now we're at 500, three services. On Easter Sunday, we're making the move to four services. We're just bought a building with a 600 seat auditorium. We're gonna have to start with two services because the building's already too small for the church that we have right now, so okay? And so, so I want you to lean in over these next several moments, and lean in and pay attention and listen because what Pastor Mike is going gonna, is gonna to share, it's changed my church and I believe by the grace of God, it will impact and help you as well. So can we thank God for the testimony that is Redemption Church in Beaumont, Texas? I think we could all go home now. The website is break200.com. You could sign up today. Uh, I'm just kidding. I want to give you some tangible, practical things. I, I do my very best to give 90% of everything that uh, we've learned away for free. Most of the time, it starts on our, uh, like the Break 200 
uh, com Instagram. It's just at break200 and then .com spelled out. But I do want to talk about six practices of a church that breaks 200. This is six practices of a church that breaks 200. And if you know anything about me, I'm not going to sit on this stool for very long because I am not Andy Stanley, theologically or uh, stylistically in my approach. Um, there, there are six practices that I think every church that breaks 200, and stay here because I want you to speak to these things. Um, the first thing that they do is they tell compelling stories. We've replaced our announcements and our offering time into story time. That's good. The reason I invited Byron to tell his story is because I could not convince you to sign up to, for Break 200 or to sign up for a program or to join me at breakfast other than when Byron tells you and shows you the graph and tells you where his church was and where his church is, that is a compelling story. And this, that's the same way you should be receiving offering. That's the same way you should be doing your announcements. That's the same way you should be raising money. And that's the same way you should be growing your church. It's through compelling story. I'll share with you one compelling story, how we raised money for youth camp scholarships. We believe that no kid should have to pay for youth camp. And no parent should have to struggle to pay for youth camp. I have three teenagers. Even I have to go and, you know, take out another mortgage to pay for youth camp. We just registered for fine arts, all three of them, eight categories. It's like, dear God, you know? Well, here's what we did. We found a student in our youth group who was saving up money to get a new phone, and she decided that instead of getting a new phone, she was gonna give that money to scholarship two of her friends to camp. So instead of me getting up and saying, y'all need to give to youth camp, it's youth camp. There's brownies in the lobby, you know. The kids will be kind of washing your car after church today, or it's our spaghetti dinner. Those are announcements. But instead, we brought Elena up on stage. We recorded a video. She shared her video. She said, I've been saving up $500 to buy a new phone, but God told me to bless two of my friends with a camp scholarship. And we did. on this video, she comes up during the offering time. She's right there. And how easy it is to write the check. <laughs> if a teenager could give up her entire savings account, how much more could you generate revenue for youth camp scholarships after telling the story? So great churches learn how to tell great stories. If you know anything about Donald Miller, he wrote this book called Story Brand. He also has this book called Hero on a Mission. Uh, I don't think he's a Christian anymore. He probably deconstructed with the rest of us and never came back. But he's, he is, he, his stuff on story is so good because it's what compels people to action. Great and growing churches don't do announcements. They tell compelling stories. I've looked at y'all's Facebook, it's a lot of announcements. I've watched y'all's live streams, it's a lot of announcements. It's a lot of information, but it's no transformation. And what compels people to action is your ability to tell great stories. We are a part of the greatest story ever told. The gospel is the greatest story ever told. I don't know about you, my life was not changed by anything other than the greatest story ever told. And we break that down when we go to build our churches into bite-sized increments. So when I start a sermon, when I start this breakout, I show you pictures of me bussing tables at Panera. I don't say, well, we just, it was really hard times. No, I, I show you, they tell you the story of walking home with a trash bag full of leftover bagels. And that, my friends, is what helps churches break the 200 barrier. You want to tell you say anything to that? Stories are captivating and stories are inspiring. The, the way that we were able to inspire people, those 50 new givers, is through telling testimonies of people stepping out in faith and taking that. And so we've done it through using video. We've uh, used it through capturing people's um, testimonies. Uh, another thing with the miraculous, one of the ways that we're uh, continuing to steward a, a move of the Holy Spirit through our first Wednesdays is uh, we capture people's testimonies and stories. And as we share that story, it gives people hope and faith to believe that the same thing could be possible for them. And so um, utilizing the gift of stories to be able to help grow your church and, and is really powerful. I would stop making internal announcements on Sundays that only apply to 10% of your people. Yeah. Right, on Wednesday night, we have a senior's luncheon, but you can only come if you're left-handed and like underwater basket <laughs> weaving. Well, you just eliminated 90% of your audience with that one announcement, and they're all checked out. 
So what gets told from the stage needs to be a story. What yeah. gets said from the stage needs to be compelling. For us, when it comes to announcement time, uh, we actually, if it doesn't apply to 90% of the church, we don't broadcast it publicly. Right. Right. That would be internal communication. So our internal communication and our external communication are different, but if it doesn't apply to 90% of our church, it doesn't go on our social media and it doesn't get platform time. Yeah, so number one, they tell compelling stories. Number two, they create simple systems. This is probably the biggest one that gets viewed the most on our online program is our next steps or assimilation process. We have a very simple, you might call it growth track, you might call it assimilation, you might call it whatever you call it, it's just a pathway for a new person to get involved in the church. We have a nine out of 10 retention rate if we can get them into what we call party with the pastor. Now I could do a whole breakout just on party with the pastor because there's some nuance to it that really helps us capture guests and keep them engaged. Our campus pastors are here today and they can walk you through exactly how we do party with the pastor. But it happens on the first Sunday of the month, rain or shine, no matter snow or sleet, no matter what. We are like the Amazon guy at my house. We, we do it every single month, no matter what. He shows up every day to my house, but we do party with the pastor every single month, no matter what. It's the first Sunday of every month. And the way that we get our leads to come to party with the pastor is through our U card. I think there's like a graph that they'll throw up on the screen. It's basically a three-step process. It's our U card, which gets mentioned every single Sunday, that's your connect card, whatever. Here's how, I'll just give you a brief example of what I do. Um, we are a multi-site church, so I look right into the camera every single Sunday and I say, hey, I know that finding a church home can be such a stressful endeavor for your family. There's a lot of factors that go into finding a church home. Is the music too loud? Is the service too long? Is the service too short? Did my kids like it? Was it too cold? Was it too warm? Is it too crazy? Is it not crazy enough? But listen, we're doing our very best to diminish all of those barriers, and we just wanna say thanks for joining us today. And if you could just do us one favor while you're here, that is to take the purple U card located in the seat around you at all of our locations. And if you fill that out, this is at the beginning of my sermon, every single Sunday, no, no matter what I'm preaching on, it's every single Sunday. If you'll take that card and you'll take it to our lobby, we have a new here area, and we'd love to put a free gift in your hand just for saying thank you for joining us. The gift is not why they turn in the card. Everyone has enough coffee mugs to go around. They turn in the card when the service was good. They turn in the card when the music was good, when the preaching was good, when the kids' check-in software actually worked and it was smooth. If they liked what they experienced, they'll willingly give us their information. If they didn't like the service, they're not giving us their information. So how do I get more guest connection cards? Make your services better. That's how you... I don't even have to ask for it. I know that they would turn it in anyways because we've done such a good job at making an excellent environment. Then on the last week of every month, our team exercises their thumbs and we pull a list of every U card turned in in the past 90 days and we cross-reference it with anyone who has never attended party with the pastor. So anyone who has attended party with the pastor, they get shoved off the list. Anyone who has not attended party with the pastor, but has turned in a U card, they get invited to party with the pastor. So we, it's a personal text message from their phone. That's right. We have Clearstream, we have text in church, we have all those things. Nothing beats the blue bubbles. Yes. If you have an Android, this isn't for you, but it, <laughs> nothing beats the knowing that there's a human being on the other side of that cell phone. Yeah. So our staff, the what, I, I pay, what do I pay them to do? I pay them to exercise their thumbs every single week. And we have several different categories of people we reach out to with our phone. Number one, first time guest. Number two, I reach out to every first time giver, no matter if you give a dollar or a million dollars. I don't even know the amount. When I get the list, I just know your name and your number. I personally text every first time giver every single Sunday, no matter what. Our campus pastors text every single first time guest every single Monday morning, no matter what. And then most of our team will text volunteers that are serving no matter what. And so you gotta use your thumbs. People don't wanna hear from the pastor via phone. Don't show up to their house with cookies. That's weird today. You gotta text them. We text, I text everyone who's ever given a dollar in our church has my personal cell phone number. Everyone. 
And what about the crazy people? There aren't no crazy people. And if there are, you just block them. It's like too easy to block callers these days. You, you just block them if it gets crazy. I had one lady, I was reading to the staff this morning. I, I, I thanked her. I, I said, thank you for giving. Thank you for, I, I normally say thank you for stepping into generosity for the first time is the kind of language that I use. And she texted me back, oh, I've been visiting a bunch of churches. I loved it. I felt the need to sow a seed. And she said, P.S., I will not be contacting you again unless I decide to join the church. <laughs> I was like, fine. But at least I know where she stands. So on the last Sunday of the month, we invite every single person who's filled out a connection card to party with the pastor. And then party with the pastor happens after every service, every first Sunday, no matter how many or how few people show up. Even at our stage, we do party with the pastor if there's three people. We'll do it. We don't cancel it. What I, talk, I talk to a lot of guys and they're like, I'm like, How, what are you doing for next steps? Well, we used to. Well, we used to do this or we do it every once a quarter or every, on, the, on the red moon whenever we read you know, John Hagee's book about the red moons. That's when we do party with the pastor or our next steps. It's like, no. Here's the deal. There are some people who can't make it to the party with the pastor that month, but it's helpful for them to know that it's consistent so that they can look forward to joining it the next month. So having it every other month, well, if I missed one, now I'm two months out from joining your church. I'm not joining your church. So the first Sunday of every month, rain or shine, party with the pastor. The second Sunday of every month is Serve 101. We believe in adding people to teams as quickly as possible. There are some barriers of entry for certain teams. You can't count the money, you can't work with kids, you can't be on the platform without certain protocol, but anyone, and I'm talking anyone, even if you just got out, can touch some pipe and drape and set it up. Anyone, and I mean anyone, no matter what your background, can wave in the parking lot to cars that are coming into the parking lot. So our barrier to entry is very low. With how we want get to get people on teams as quickly as possible. So our first date is party with the pastor. And we just recorded this last week's party with the pastor. It will be on break200.com. And we, then we have serve 101, which is our, basically, do you remember the ministry fair when people would walk across the front with all their ministries, Royal Rangers, Impact Girls? It was missionettes in my day. So it's still missionettes to me. You know, all the different ministries. We do that, but we do that in serve 101, which is our next steps process. How is your next steps process? So when we started the church, we didn't have one at all, like I mentioned, and then we adopted Growth Track. So it was a four week process, and I'm sure it might work for your church. Did not work for my church. Um, our people didn't, today, most, the average churchgoer attends less than two times a month today. Right. So at best, you're getting somebody one Sunday a month. And so you're asking them now to commit to four and we would have people who would be in our church for six months, seven months, and they would be like, when's the next 301? And it's like, ah, it was last week. You have to wait another month. And so we tried this thing uh, that we called a fast track and we were like, hey, let's just do it all in one day. And we had like 40 people join the team that day. We're like, oh, there's an idea here. And that's when we learned about Breaking 200 and Mike's system to where on the first Sunday is, we call it next steps. Second Sunday is serve 101. And so on that next steps, we just say, hey, me and my wife, Ashley, we just wanna buy lunch and get to know you and share the vision and invite you to get connected. And so we have a lunch for everybody. We just go to Sam's Club, buy a whole bunch of sandwiches and a bag of chips and people sit around and we just talk. And then I stand up and say, hey, here's the vision of the church. Here's where we've been. Here's where we're going. And the only way that this is possible is number one, because the Lord is blessing it. And two, because we have amazing people like you. And we would love for you to, to jump on and join our team. I introduce it to our, a few of our senior level directors just to be able to say hi. And then they fill out a form, invite to serve one-on-one -on -one the next week. And then they're immediately on a team yeah. right after That's that. That's right. That's right. If you attended our church on a first Sunday and you came to party with the pastor, you can be serving by your third Sunday. Yep. Right. Not in every team, but in most teams. <laughs> Now, there's some nuance to party with the pastor, and I wish I could take you through how Pastor Michael and Pastor Ed, our campus pastors, do party with the pastor, because people are at a point of decision at party with the pastor. If they're kicking the tires, they're ready to join the church. So what he has them do is he has them pull out their phone, and there's a QR code on the screen, and what we have them in the RSVP form for Serve 101, which is the following week, they get to put their, their favorite Starbucks drink, and we bring it to them the next week. Now, this is key. Here's why. If not, there's nothing that tethers them to their commitment. But now I have a personal menued item that tethers them to their next step. So on Saturday, 
before the second Sunday of Serve 101, Pastor Michael, Pastor Ed, all of our campus pastors, they say, hey, Joey, notice that you wanted a Trenta white hot white mocha, whatever it's called, white hot mocha with extra shots. I'll have it ready for you at the 9 a.m. service as you RSVP'd. Here's what happens. Can't wait, I'll be there. Or, oh, I got sick, I can't be there. Now we're not wasting money on people's custom overpriced coffee. Does this make sense? That's just one little nuance. There's a lot of other nuances that we do at Party with the Pastor, but I don't have time and with to share the, all of with them. With the text message, with the, the, the Starbucks drink, uh, with the goodie bag, it really shows your care yes. and how intentional you are. Yes. And it breaks people's perception of pastors and churches. When, when they see the blue bubbles, the game is over. There hasn't been a pastor that has personally texted them in years. The game is over. So just if the church doesn't pay for your phone bill, just have the church pay for your phone bill, upgrade to unlimited data and go after that thing yeah. because that's where all of the retention is at. All right, the next thing is this. Uh, churches that break 200, they also, they build wider schedules. They build wider schedules. I, I, uh, uh, this is so important. It, there's easy math. A church of 200 needs 57 confirmed volunteers every single week. I know that every context is different and you're such a good leader that you don't need 57. You could do it with 12 people that are always about to quit on you. But on average, a church of 200 needs 57 people on their team. Here's the easy math. Go to the next slide. It's 200 divided by three and a half people equals 57. For every one person in attendance, for every one volunteer, there's usually three and a half people in attendance. So how do you build your church? You build the team. How do I grow this church from zero to 200? How do I grow it? I grow the team. You need a wider schedule of people. Uh, I'll, I'll equate it to, Greg Ford said this one day, and it, was, it, it changed my life forever. He said, what, what makes a great president is their ability to create jobs because that's what helps the economy is when everyone is working. In order to grow your church, in order to fix the economy of your church, right. you have to create more jobs. Your approval rating goes up when the unemployment rate of your church goes down. That's right. The issue with a lot of your churches is you're the one doing everything and your unemployment rate is too high because you're taking jobs from people. You're receiving the offering, you're picking up the communion, you're going to the P.O. box to do the mail, you're doing the check deposit, you're counting the offering, you're robbing jobs. And what's happened is the unemployment rate in your church is high, but the lower the unemployment rate, the higher the approval rating, and you will find that your church grows when you learn to create jobs. It's a, it's a mindset shift, not what all can I do? How many people do I need? No, 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 it's how many people can we use? That's right. That's Let me right. show you our schedule. This is our, our schedule across um, for one Sunday. One Sunday, this is the army that we build. We build armies at Focus Church. I only do one thing. I show up at 9.01 for the 9 a.m. service, I preach, and then I go home while they're still singing. Why? Because I created jobs. I only have one job, that's to deliver the gospel. My preaching has gotten better, and I don't have to do the things that I'm terrible at, which is a lot. You don't want me doing kids' ministry. You don't want me singing. I'm doing one thing. But it took 10 years to build that job network. Anything in related to yeah, like, you building can't control, wider schedules? What they say is you can't control the weather, but here's what you can control. You can't control what you wear for the weather or for that day. You can't control how many people come to your church on a Sunday. So, so get that out of your head. Don't be like, ah, we need this many people. How many people do we have? That's beyond your control. But what you can control is how many people serve. So great. And so focus, our first thing is we, uh, we always ask, how many people do we have serve in Sunday? And how many people serve today? We don't count the, num we, we, yes. they count the offering on Monday. We don't worry about the numbers until later. The right. biggest thing we say is how many people are serving? And that's the number because that's something you can control. Yes. So focus on what you can control and not things that are out of your control. If I were to ask all of you in this room uh, how many you had on Sunday, you would know how many you had in attendance. If I asked how much money you had in your bank account currently, you'd know that number. But if I asked how many people do you have currently confirmed to serve this weekend at your church? Crickets, right? It's hard. But that is the number that helps grow churches is once you figure out how many jobs you're offering people, it, it takes it to another level. We had record serving numbers this weekend, correct? 
How, we had confirmed, 251 confirmed a, 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 across the church, and, and we had our largest attended Sunday uh, in the history of our church because we had the largest attended we had the largest confirmed volunteers. I knew we were gonna break the record <laughs> before we broke the record. And I'm sorry to take all the spiritualness out of this equation for just a second. We pray like it depends on God, but we work like it depends on us. And so when I know when we're gonna break records because we're gonna about to, we break records of how many people are confirmed to serve on a Sunday. All right, let's go to the next one. Uh, churches that break 200, they lead sharper staffs. You need to start treating some of the high capacity people in your church like they're on your team. You're not burdening them when you ask them for a meeting. You're not burdening them when you call for an, an extra meeting to plan out Easter. You need to start treating people who you can't pay as if you could pay them and watch what happens. Yeah. I've met so many pastors afraid to reach out to people to ask them to join in on an initiative or to help them grow the church Yet these people are hungry. They're desperately looking for purpose. They're desperately looking to be involved. They want to take things off their pastor's plate. It would, nothing would bring them more joy than to be on your team, but they've never been asked. Great leaders are not found, they're formed. So when is the last time that you had a meeting with some of the people in your church to discuss Easter that's coming up in very, very soon? You gotta, lead, you gotta lead a sharp, so when I say staff, it's just because it ended with S. I'm not talking about paid staff. I'm talking about people that you could leverage as volunteers. Now I have an incredible paid staff, but it wasn't always like that. Yeah. I can take you back to when it was just Michael Whitlock and I in charity, we'd go to Costco for $3 hot dogs for lunch. <laughs> that was the only thing we could afford. And here's the deal, we, we would do is we had Millionaire Monday, where you'd all dress up like millionaires because it's the business of the Lord that we were in. And we had staff meeting on Monday night so all of our volunteers could join us. Yeah. If we did that for the first five or six years, we didn't have a, a, a daytime staff meeting for the past four years is when that started. For the first six years, we didn't have a daytime staff meeting. The sun was down every time we met. <laughs> So we put the kids down, we pull up the Zoom. We put the kids down, we go to the, to the to, we used to use the, um, what was it, Whole Foods? Whole Foods had a free conference room. You, you just, it was like a community room. We used to have a staff meeting with no one on payroll in the Whole Foods conference room. Why? Because I was treating them as though they would be, yeah. even before they were. Can I just build your faith for a minute? They, they want to be a part of your dream. They want to serve the church. They just want to be asked and they need to be told clearly what to do and what not to do. What do you have to say about leading sharper staffs? Whenever you make the decision to go and break 200, you need to recognize that there will be people on your team today that will not be a part of your church tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And that's actually a good thing. Um, because if they're not down for the ride, they're just gonna hold you back. And if you stop, then you're no longer the leader they are because now they've captured the vision and they're, you're hostage to them. When you make that decision to move, you will lose people. And you know what, that is okay. Jesus says, no man puts his hand to the plow unless he first counts the cost. Yes. You need to consider the cost of breaking 200 and, and what it's going to, to take of you. And as you do make those staff changes, God will begin to bless and to reward that as well because you're making the hard work uh, and, and moving forward. I tell our team like, hey, if you don't wanna be in this direction, you don't have to be. Yeah. There's other churches that are more suited for the speed and the pace and the style in which you desire to be at. And so if you don't agree with where we're heading, then I wanna help you find a church that you can be in unity with. And I'll make calls to other pastors in the area around that I think could be a better fit for them, but I know where we're heading yeah. and I'm not gonna compromise what God's asked me to do because somebody is unwilling to follow. Yes, so good, so good. During the week, I'll walk outside of our, in our parking lot at our office and I'll see all these guys on the phone and what they're doing are, they're doing one-on-ones with volunteers every single week. And if you have a chance to ask Pastor Michael or Pastor Ed or any of my guys or gals that are here, um, they can help you kind of navigate through what it looks like to lead volunteers. I have this incredible privilege now to not have to lead volunteers. My wife reminds me of this all the time. 
because she still leads a, a, a large team of volunteers. She's like, you don't know what it's like to have to have meetings in the evening anymore. I'm like, well, by golly, get them here at 9 a.m. You know, that's when I get to the office. But these guys understand what it takes to lead an army of unpaid but very willing volunteers. And that's what it's gonna take to break the 200 barrier. There's my guy right there, Trevor, raise your hand right there. There's our ministries director, Yes. Uh, 300 plus volunteers under his care. So, so he's great. available to you as well. That's awesome. All right, the next one is this, this one's fun. They utilize marketing strategies. Um, they tell compelling stories, they create simple systems, they build wider schedules, they lead sharper staffs, and they utilize marketing strategies. Can you throw up that picture of that kid that I hired in the early days of our church, I hired a kid to uh, dress up as the devil, okay? He dressed up as the devil, and he had a large sign that said, I hate focuschurch.com. So I hired a protester. This was before protesting was cool, okay? <laughs> this was before it became popular, okay? Uh, and he would protest our church on, the, on a very busy intersection, and he was, had a red cape, and he had horns, and he said, I, it said, I hate focuschurch.com. And we saw more traffic when we hired that kid because the, the tagline for the splash page whenever it was up there was, it's a church that Satan hates because it's a church that you're going to love. Wow. So when they went to ihatefocuschurch.com, that was the bold statement at the top, and then it was me. Hey, my name is Mike. You probably got to this page because you saw somebody protesting our, our church in front of the Panera Bread, which is where I worked. And so it was, and, and, and here's what happened. People would call the church. Do you know that somebody's protesting you right now? <laughs> no, tell us more. <laughs> tell me. Yeah. Well, hey, you know what you can really help us do? You can help us by leaving us a five-star Google review. Well, I've never been to your church. It's okay. Just leave us a five-star review <laughs> so that we can beat these protesters to death, you know? We would get so much traction in the marketing strategy side. They, they, there's another thing that I did, and you can, I don't think know if they got these slides because I added this one in this morning, but uh, we had this sign, and I would just work the streets with this backpack sign. It was over my head, and I would just pass out cards. I passed out 30,000 invite cards, printed invite cards with our team before launch. 30,000. I don't know how many Easter invite cards you ordered for this year's Easter, the chances of you ordering 30,000 are probably pretty slim. And we passed out 10,000 Freezy Pops in one day on 4th of July. We filled up everyone's freezer five days before 4th of July, bought as cheap coolers as I could find, the cheapest coolers I could find, put all the Freezy Pops in, and we walked around to every 4th of July parade in every town that surrounded our church with scissors, because nobody likes to bite the plastic off the, off the top of a Freezy Pop, and we cut every Freezy Pop, we handed out invite card, 10,000 Freezy Pops in one day. Come on. Now, I don't know about you, but there are some things that you just can't pray for. Yeah. You can't pray for personal connections with people at 4th of July festivals. You gotta get out there and you gotta be out there. You can't speak in tongues your way to reaching your community in a very tangible and practical way like that. So you're gonna have to get some hustle. You're gonna have to gird up your loins. You're gonna have to get some grit. You're gonna have to do some things that no one else is doing yeah. in order to reach people that no one else is reaching. That's right. So you, I had to, you know, I, I, I also wore the devil costume and I, I didn't know what to do the Saturday before launch Sunday. I was a nervous wreck. Is anyone gonna show up? So I got in my car, I drove to the intersection, and I just played the devil for four hours. Because I wanted as much web traffic as possible the day before our grand opening. So what'd you do the day before your grand opening? I dressed up as Satan. And I protested my own church. <laughs> And to God be the glory, it worked. My wife conceived our first child on the day before our grand opening. So. <laughs> That's what you did yeah. on the day before your grand opening. But you already had three, so. <laughs> That's right. That's right. There's just, there's some community events that you need to be at. There's some flyers you need to print. There's some door hangers you need to put on your door. Like the ground game is so weak sometimes when I talk to guys that are looking to break the 200 barrier. Yeah, I go to your Facebook page and you still got Mother's Day graphics from 2020. Yeah. I go to your YouTube channel and it's, it sounds like uh, you plugged in one wire and you let the whole stream go the whole time. Do you know what people are looking at when they go to look for your church? What your reputation is on the internet. Yeah. So stop streaming bad music. Yeah. Stop streaming bad music. It's not worth it. It's only your grandmother that's watching. <laughs> when they go to look for churches near me, do you have a Yelp? account 
where your leadership team has given five-star reviews? Have you done a Google My Business page where you have five-star reviews? These are practical things that anyone who owns a small business is ruthlessly pursuing, yeah. and yet for some reason we can't do that in the kingdom of God? Come on. We are in the most important business in the world. That's right. We're the only business that deals with eternity. That's right. How much more important it is for us to have an online reputation that actually matters. Yeah. I, I'll get off my soapbox now. I would say that as a pastor, your personal Facebook and Instagram is actually more important than the church's. This is correct. I, more people connect with me than they connect in the church. More comments are on my posts than on the church's. And so you need to understand that what you say and what your staff says is a representation of the church. And so monitor your own personal. And then the second thing I'll add is CMN has some great partners. Yes. We use John Michael Sherman over yes, at Rocket he's, he's Media. Right there. Where's he at? There's he right there. At Rocket Media, Google Grants, Google Ads, Instagram Facebook ads. ads, Instagram ads. Whenever we had Easter last year, we had 200 additional people beyond our service because we've ran ads with John Michael at Rocket Media. And then also Church Media Squad. We've been using them for about three or four years now. And I know church planters, you're like the sticker price on it. You cannot afford not to have social media and good graphics these days. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. can't not afford it. It's, it's a must. So don't operate out of a lack mindset, but an abundance mindset. Yes. And go ahead and sign up for the unlimited package with Church Media Squad. <laughs> Game changer for us. Unlimited video reels, website discounts with Church Co. I mean, the whole shebang. And it's all for less than what you would pay a stipend kids worker for an entire month. I I mean, the way that they serve the church is phenomenal. Yeah. And so um, less than a staff member, you have access to their entire team, John Michael, yep. uh, Radiant Printing. Use the resources your tribe has built networks and relationship with. That's They're right. out in the lobby, and so go talk to them yep. before tonight's session. John Michael helped us launch our South location with over 400 in attendance. So we made an investment. And John Michael, plus our ground game, all right? It was ground game and the blessing of John Michael. A lot of people go to hire John Michael, but they don't want to pass out any flyers themselves. Right. I'm like, you have to do both. He's not the, the golden ticket. He's just uh, one of the silver bullets, but there's a bunch of other ones that you need to use. And so I'm very grateful for John Michael. All right, the last thing that they do, uh, they preach biblical sermons. People are hungry for the word. They ain't hungry for no motivational speech. They're not hungry for some cute three points in a poem. They want the word. They want, the, they want spirit and truth. What a word today, by the way. Excellent. You, if you're not preaching the Bible, you're never going to grow your church. It is the blessing of God when you learn to distribute the food of God from the sacred desk with clarity, conviction, and such precision that people are compelled to come back every single week. Even if you're bivocational, and I know many of you are bivocational, you have to prioritize the delivery of your message. They will not come back if they are not being fed in the spirit. You could have the slickest website, the coolest logo, the best kids ministry in town. If you are not preaching the Bible, they can smell it, they can see it, and they won't come back. And I know that that sounds like super elementary, like oh, I preach the Bible. How much time are you putting into it? Yeah. How much investment are you putting into it? How much clarity are you bringing? Are you preaching too long? Some of you are preaching too long. You, you, need, to, you need to go back. I, Sam Chan just said this in, a, in the last session. He said, during COVID, you learned how to preach for 20 minutes because no one was in the room. He said, and now you've backslidden to 45 minutes. He's like, you need to come back to COVID time and preach a little less with some more intensity and intentionality. Listen, Byron and I are here to help you. I, I, I'm here to serve you any way that I can. I'm gonna give you my cell phone number um, just so that you can text me directly. My cell phone number is this, if you're ready, it's 919-912-6499. Again, that's 919-912-6499. Uh, someone, someone tried to put me on the uh, DNC uh, text message list whenever I gave my my uh, phone number away last time. Don't do National that. Convention. Yeah, the Democratic National Convention. Don't do that. All right, I do not appreciate that. I'll sign up for text alerts that I want. And uh, so you, you can keep that to yourself. 
but that is my cell phone number, 919-912-6499. We are hosting a breakfast tomorrow. It will be majority Q&A because I know we're out of time today. Our entire team will be there, and I'd love just to have you. It really helps if you RSVP so that I know how much breakfast to buy. Right. So if you don't RSVP and you just show up, then I don't know how much food to bring. But it's on me. I want to thank CMN for all the time. Would you pray a prayer blessing over Absolutely, these guys? Yeah. I want to start by saying thank you, Pastor Mike, for, for doing this. Can we give it up for Mike investing in pastors breaking the 200? I'm telling you, it is worth it is worth the investment. It's, it's $197 for the whole year. It's 197 He didn't even break 200 on the price. Come on, guys. So... Um, so $197 for the whole year. For the whole year. Yeah, it's, it's, I mean, it's four seasons, right? It's, well, it's unlimited. We're in uh, season well, five. Now. You're in season five now. It's like Netflix for churches. Yeah, there's uh, documents, it's, 130 videos. We're walking our elders right now through a new eldership process, and his eldership process and book is in there. And so all of our elders are going through it. It's not just the breaking the numbers. It's entire overhaul. So thank you again, Mike. Man, I am so grateful. I know that our church is as well. And so I just want to say thank you. Let me pray a, a prayer over us. Lord Jesus, thank you for each and every person who's in this room. Thank you for the pastors, the men and the women, for the call of God on their life, for the yes that they have given. And so, Father, we ask that by your spirit, you would empower them with systems, but with your power and your system and your Holy Spirit as well. And so, Lord, bless them as they lead their churches and go back home. In Jesus' strong name we pray. Amen. Thank you guys so much.